A quiet, uneventful morning flying over the South China Sea. In one moment, everything is calm. In the next, bang! A myriad of alarms start blaring in the cockpit as the two experienced pilots look to both diagnose and resolve the problem that has just ensued on board this Queen of the Skies. Despite the blaring sounds of their instruments being dramatic enough, what's happened in the passenger cabin is even more terrifying. Oxygen masks are strewn across the wide body cabin, along with a portion of the aircraft's fuselage on the right side, encompassing part of the cabin floor being completely blown off, creating a gaping hole into the internal circuitry of this wounded metallic bird. With the precious supply of oxygen within the masks running out for the passengers, it would be a true race against time for the pilots to bring the plane down safely on the ground. The story of Qantas Flight 30 is one of focus, dedication, and an unshakable faith in sticking to that age-old mantra in aviation. Aviate, navigate, and communicate. So, ladies and gentlemen, sit back and get ready to delve into the first of many such aviation and aerospace disasters covering what went down. It's a warm summer morning on the 25th of July 2008 at Hong Kong's Chep Lap Kok Airport. Having been in commercial operation since 1998, Hong Kong International Airport is one of the largest passenger hubs and gateways for destinations to and from China, Asia, and the rest of the world. The airport is the world's busiest cargo gateway and one of the world's busiest passenger airports. Meanwhile, our main protagonist for the story is a 17-year-old Boeing 747-400 currently in operation under Qantas Airways, the official flag carrier of Australia and the country's largest airline. Despite the age of this bird sounding old to people outside of aviation, 17 years is actually quite average, with the Boeing 747, often dubbed the Queen of the Skies, having an average age of around 21 years. This particular bird has just completed a nearly 12 and a half hour leg from London Heathrow Airport and is now ready to embark on the second leg of its journey homebound towards Melbourne in Australia after a quick stopover here in Hong Kong. The pilot in command for this flight is 53-year-old Captain John Bartels. Having amassed over 25 years of experience under Qantas itself, along with a further 7 years of experience under the Royal Australian Navy, it is safe to say this aircraft was well equipped to handle any emergencies thrown its way. Supporting the captain as co-pilot was First Officer Bernd Werninghaus. Though the modern Boeing 747-400 need just two pilots in the flight deck, the long duration of the route from London Heathrow to Melbourne with a stopover in Hong Kong warranted the need for a further second officer. Pilots on long-haul flights such as this will often have one or two extra pilots to ensure that the primary crew is well rested for the crucial phases of flight, namely takeoff and landing. The secondary flight crew will alternate with the primary crew during the flight, ensuring everyone is sharp when they need to be, while ensuring that there are always two qualified pilots in the cockpit at all times. On board Qantas Flight 30 today, the role of said second officer will be fulfilled by Paul Tabak. The three pilots will be assuming responsibility for nearly 346 passengers in the back, as well as an additional 16 crew members who would offer the ultimate Qantas experience to their patrons. At approximately 8.45 a.m. local time, baggage loading, catering, and refueling services would likely have concluded, and at precisely 9 a.m., the aircraft begins to push back from its gate at the international terminal. Captain Bartels and First Officer Werninghaus successfully start all four of the massive Rolls-Royce engines on this jumbo jet, with the aircraft roaring to life on the taxiway. After completing a standard 10 to 15 minute taxi to the runway, the aircraft swiftly departs Hong Kong International Airport at approximately 9.22 a.m. local time and begins its climb into the skies. Passengers enjoy a stunning view of Hong Kong's unique landscapes, with the South China Sea engulfing both the thriving metropolis of the city of Hong Kong as well as the various mountains and hills it surrounds. The aircraft continues to climb successfully through 10,000 feet, continuing to speed up and make its way to its initial cruising altitude of 29,000 feet, known in aviation as Flight Level 290. This is the altitude where Qantas 30 will level off and arrest its climb, continuing its seemingly uneventful journey towards Melbourne. 
As the aircraft edges its way towards its cruise altitude, the pilots turn the seatbelt signs off and allow the crew to start their onboard services, offering the passengers the ability to use the lavatories on board and move around the cabin if desired. Everything was fine up until this point, with nothing interesting to report. But then, suddenly, 55 minutes into the flight at around 10.17 AM Hong Kong time, bang! A reverberating loud bang goes off in the cabin, jolting the passengers and the cabin crew upright. A large gaping hole appears in the floor of the passenger cabin, offering an uncharacteristic glimpse into the internal circuitry of this marvel of engineering. The decorative curtains begin to rustle as the precious air in the cabin quickly escapes through the very same hole, and to the unanticipated shock of everyone on board, oxygen masks drop from the ceiling. The cabin has depressurized. Suddenly, everything that was calm and serene about this flight has quickly become the opposite. Passengers quickly adorn their oxygen masks, but the supply of precious air within these yellow tabs isn't infinite, and it is now up to the pilots to do the rest to ensure everyone's safety. In the flight deck, the pilots are bombarded with a cacophony of warnings and master caution alarms, indicating a cabin depressurization event has occurred. Captain Bartels immediately notes the severity of the situation and knows that his first order of business is to initiate an emergency descent to an altitude of around 10,000 feet. This is to ensure that there is sufficient breathable air present for humans to breathe naturally without their oxygen masks. You see, at Earth's surface, not only is there oxygen for us humans to breathe, but also the required atmospheric pressure to allow us to push those oxygen molecules across the membranes of our lungs. As we go up in altitude, the atmospheric pressure decreases. This is why all aircraft are pressurized when the doors are locked and armed by the cabin crew prior to departure, creating artificial pressure to allow you to breathe without a mask on board a plane even at high altitudes. With the quantity of breathable oxygen in limited supply within the oxygen masks, it is imperative for the plane to get down to an altitude where the surrounding pressure can facilitate breathing for everyone on board. In the flight deck, Captain Bartels and First Officer Werninghaus quickly adorned their own specialized oxygen masks. After silencing the various redundant alarms, the captain assumes manual control of the aircraft by disarming the autopilot and pushing the aircraft's nose downward. Estimates from the data collected using the onboard flight data recorder indicate the descent from 29,000 feet down to a safe altitude took just five and a half minutes, with the aircraft leveling off at 10,000 feet at just around 10.24 AM Hong Kong time. This would indicate that the aircraft descended at nearly 3,500 feet every single minute. It is at this point that the flight crew knows that they can stow their oxygen masks and breathe safely, while planning the next course of action. It is apparent that the aircraft is not going to make it to Melbourne at this point, as the flight has just completed around an hour out of the 9 hour total flight time between Hong Kong and their destination. Hence, Qantas Flight 30 needs to divert to a suitable airport to safely land and assess the damage that has been caused to this marvel of engineering. In consultation with the appropriate air traffic control officers at the time, the pilots decide on Manila in the Philippines as their chosen diversion airport, as it offers a decent runway length combined with the necessary emergency vehicles and support they need upon arrival. The pilots likely program this route into their flight management computer, or FMC, which is responsible for calculating the various weight and balance parameters combined with the ideal speed, route, and trajectory of the aircraft throughout the flight. It is highly likely that the second officer, Paul Tabak, has also joined the flight deck at this point to assist in the added workload that has been piled upon the primary crew. As the aircraft approaches Manila, the pilots run through their pertinent checklists in order to assess whether they have any further inoperative systems to contend with as a result of the blast. Sure enough, the crew note that two semi-important systems are damaged and not usable for their approach and landing into their destination. These are the onboard instrument landing systems, or ILSs, of which there are three on board, as well as the ever-important anti-skid system. The ILS assists pilots in performing a stabilized approach and landing into an airport by locking onto a set of lateral and vertical beacons near the runway. Both these beacons work in tandem to allow the aircraft to approach the runway at just the right altitude while keeping in line with the center line of the runway. 
Due to there being little to no inclement weather on the day, combined with near-perfect visibility, the ILS wasn't entirely necessary for the pilots to perform a safe landing, as any number of alternate landing procedures could be used instead. The damage to the anti-skid system, on the other hand, will make this landing more challenging for the crew. This system is designed to optimize and provide maximum braking efficiency under all runway conditions. By prohibiting any of the wheels from slowing down too much while rolling on the ground, the anti-skid system does just what the name suggests. It prevents each of these wheels from skidding on the runway. The pilots would therefore have to remain extremely cautious when braking the aircraft once touched down. As the aircraft approaches Manila, cabin reports indicate that the passengers and cabin crew are relatively calm at this point, noting that the initial panic from the bang has now subsided, and members of the cabin crew have instilled a certain calm in the cabin. The pilots receive final directional vectors from ATC and line up with the runway. With the runway lights on, the flaps extended, and the airspeed decreased, the first officer lowers the landing gear of the aircraft. Captain Bartels disconnects the autopilot yet again and assumes manual control of Qantas Flight 30. He knows that he needs to be careful as nobody really has any idea regarding how substantial the damage to the aircraft is, and in its current fragile state, with the anti-skid systems not operational, he would need to ensure a quick, safe, and fast touchdown. Nearly 30 minutes after experiencing the cacophony of alarms the pilots were subjected to in the flight deck, Qantas Flight 30 touches down safely on the ground and comes to a complete stop on the runway at Ninoy Aquino International Airport in Manila. The pilots breathe a sigh of relief and quickly inspect their instruments, checking the brake temperatures of their wheels to ensure they weren't too hot. Once the ground personnel evaluated the structural integrity of the aircraft and deemed it okay, the aircraft is allowed to slowly taxi to a suitable gate, where every single one of the 365 passengers and crew safely disembark from the aircraft. It is now that the crew and passengers get their first look at what has happened to the exterior of their beloved aircraft. The hole in the fuselage, in a roughly inverted T-shape, is up to 2 meters wide and approximately 1.5 meters high. The wing fuselage fairing is missing, revealing some palletized cargo in the hold. However, the freight forwarder reported that all items on the manifest were accounted for. Other than some items which were located near the origin of the accident and resulting hole, no other cargo or baggage on the flight is damaged. Soon after the accident, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, who led the investigation into this event, announced that they found an oxygen cylinder which was located in the area of the explosion had not been accounted for. The valve and mounting brackets were found for the cylinder, but out of the 13 oxygen cylinders present in the aircraft, number 4 was missing. Further updates confirmed their suspicion regarding the culprit of the accident, with the ATSB citing that it was evident that one passenger oxygen cylinders, number 4 from a bank of 7 cylinders along the right side of the cargo hold, had sustained a sudden failure and forceful discharge of its pressurized contents into the aircraft hold, rupturing the fuselage in the vicinity of the wing fuselage leading edge fairing. The cylinder had been propelled upward by the force of the discharge, puncturing the cabin floor and entering the cabin adjacent to the second main cabin door. The cylinder had subsequently impacted the door frame, door handle and overhead paneling before falling to the cabin floor and exiting the aircraft through the ruptured fuselage. Since the incident, Qantas was ordered by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority to inspect all of its oxygen cylinders and brackets which hold the cylinders on its Boeing 747 fleet, which Qantas of course has complied with. Despite this incident, the company has had a nearly impeccable safety record, with AirlineRatings.com rating Qantas as the world's safest airline in 2023. It is because of the company's ongoing commitment to keep their fleets fresh, their cabin crew well trained, and their pilots sharp that an event such as this doesn't end in disaster or any subpar consequences for anyone involved. The impeccable nature of their standard operating procedures, combined with crisp communication and stellar decision making while battling uncertain failures to ensure the safety of everyone on board, makes this story not the most dramatic, but certainly a very educational one. 
As such, we here at Flyby Simulations truly hope you enjoyed the story of Qantas Flight 30 and will join us for many future iterations of our What Went Down series. If you guys enjoyed this episode and wish to see more such content, please make sure to give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and press the bell icon to be notified when we upload future videos as well. Additionally, if you wish to suggest future flights for us to analyze here at Flyby Simulations, click on the first link down below the like button to join our free Discord server. It's a thriving community of passionate aviation enthusiasts, and we will exclusively be taking flight suggestions over on that platform. As usual, thanks for watching, and thanks for flying by.